The West Penra Papers A Journey Through the Multiverse The Second Level of Learning HTTP colon slash slash westpenry.com Genesis Paper Number 4, The Beginning of a Tyranny by West Penra, Saturday, August 18, 2012 Revised, Sunday, September 23, 2012 HTTP colon slash slash westbenry.com 5. Integrating Project Elohim with Earlier Experiments ENKI's new creation was met with much skepticism and critique from the Syrian overlords. They understood the dilemma with cloning, and if it had to be done in such a speed, each generation of cloned APA would be an inferior copy of the one before and the whole species would deteriorate with time, making weaker workers. No one seemed to question in Lil's way of treating ENKI's creation, however, and very little consideration was put into the fact that Nin and ENKI had had to work themselves to total exhaustion to the brink of burning out, in order to catch up with Lord and Lil's quick consumption of human prototypes. In Lil, of course, did not like the idea of a sexual human for many reasons. He didn't want them to be distracted by sexual needs and he didn't like that they had been allowed to be introduced to the Tree of Life and the secrets of the gods. It was alarming and shouldn't be allowed. These beings were supposedly made to be workers slash slaves, and nothing more. Now they had been allowed to taste the elixir of the gods. In Lil burst out, I truly hope you didn't give them our longevity too. In fact, ENK I hadn't. He knew that it was not going to be accepted and he told the council that Adamus would be short-lived. Still, old scriptures tell us that some humans lived for more than a thousand years, but a thousand years was still a blink of an eye from the gods' perspective. Besides, some of the humans, like Abraham and other in Lil slash YHVH's patriarchs, needed their longer lifespan to be able to play out the role they had been assigned by the gods. To in Lil's dismay, the new species which they called the Lulu, the mixed being, among the star races, was accepted. It was a sarcastic, and quite a humiliating term, classifying them in the same category as low-conscious animals. There was one crux, however. They were again too clever, and Enlil wanted their intelligence reduced. This time, for some reason, the council voted against Enlil, who in his fury said that at least the copulation had to be supervised and it must be supervised by him, Lord and Lil himself. And males and females needed to be separated so they didn't go berserk on each other. On these two points, the council agreed. In Lil calmed down a little. Enki had mixed feelings. He didn't like to be supervised by his oppressive brother, Project Elohim was his experiment, and his brother knew next to nothing about cloning. But Enki did not dare to speak up afraid to lose the little influence he had. So Enlil was still put in charge of the mining process, and Enki was in charge of the plantations, making sure the wheat and important herbs and vegetables were being produced. At daytime, the males and females had to be separated from each other on the field, and Enki was sure they were separated in the mines as well. He knew pretty well how Enlil would treat them there, where Enki couldn't supervise the situation, and this aggravated him, but he still decided to continue the experiment here on Earth, in spite of the suffering his creation had to go through. At times, an excited Enlil showed up on the plains with a line of chained Lulus, whom he thought were standing out by being strong, obedient and just intelligent enough to understand his every command, in other words, from Enlil's viewpoint, a lesser intelligent Lulu was a better Lulu. He wanted them to reproduce so he could get a strong and obedient offspring for the mines. Enki put the chosen ones together in a cave, two by two, under his brother's supervision. Enlil told him who was going to mate with whom and there, in the caves, offspring were made. Lord Enlil was not the chief administrator of Terra Nova when the Titans were gone, and was also in charge of all projects that were going on by Syrians, except Project Elohim which Enki had managed to talk himself into remaining in charge of, although Enlil had the last word when deciding who was allowed to reproduce. Enlil stayed at the plantations for quite a while long enough to think it was appropriate to build a big cabin on one of the hills, from where he could overlook the production down in the valley. 
The sun was extremely hot and the plantations had to be watered constantly by a sprinkler system, which also kept the workers relatively cool. Under Enki's supervision, they were handed food three times a day, but now when Lord and Lil came visiting that changed. The workers were fed once a day, which was in the evenings, and they all had to beg for it. Again, this created a lot of bad blood between the brothers, and Enki didn't talk much to Enlil while he was at the plantations, at which he sometimes could stay for extended periods of time, something that annoyed Enki. As soon as his oppressive brother left, however, Enki let the males and females join together and copulate in the evenings in the garden, across the plantations. This was their only pleasure, which they appreciated to the fullest, and which also made them work harder during the days, only because they were happier, and appreciated of their master. The first thing Enlil noticed was the increase in production, and for a while he thought that maybe he had been wrong, and that sexual beings actually work harder, but on the other hand, he was not going to let Enki take credit for that, so he told Enki that he needed the production to go up even more. The demand was great, he said. Enki was not stupid, he knew what went on in his brother's mind, but he couldn't do anything about it as long as Enlil was in charge. However, he still let the Lulus reproduce freely in the garden. But Enlil started getting suspicious, because Enki had way too many workers in the plantations. Many of them were asexual, but something was not right. Quite a few of them acted differently, although they apparently tried to hide it they were more intelligent and aware. When he realized what Enki had done, he ran into his brother's office and started screaming and shouting and accusing him of breaking their agreement, and worse. Enki countered by yelling back, saying Enlil treated his creation worse than any animal, whipping them, screaming at them, hunting them down when they tried to hide, torturing them, killing them, and even eating them. Enlil said it's nothing wrong with that. After all, they're only Lulus and as such, dispensable. The whole outbreak ended in a fist fight, and the two had to be separated. When Enlil calmed down enough not to attack his brother, and with four strong reptilian guards holding him back, he wheezed between his teeth, while catching his breath, I want all these filthy Lulus of your out of the garden now. The garden will from now on belong to those paying allegiance to me and who follow my commands. You can take your misfits and let them free in the woods. I hope they'll get killed by tigers and bears. I from here on declare the Garden of Eden my property. Enki gathered his creation, those who were willing to follow their creator, and took off into the forest. There were still quite a few sexual humans who were too afraid to follow Enki. However, Lord and Lil had scared them until they shook a fear from what most certainly would happen if they went into the wide open forests without the supervision of an army. He said it was extremely dangerous out there, with horrible monsters, demons and man-eaters behind every other tree. They wouldn't survive a day out there. So, out of fear, many Lulus stayed within Lil and became his obedient property. This was probably the time when most Syrians, and Enki as well, took on human bodies to blend in with the human population, although it seems like the bodies they created for themselves were taller, and perhaps even stronger than the ones used in the slave camps. We still see some reptilian artifact from more recent times, and the reason for that could be that not all of the gods changed body types, or only did so when the old one stopped working properly. Some of the statues and statuettes we see can also be depictions of Syrians and other star races manifesting in their avatars, it's hard to say. 6. The Tree of Knowledge and the Tree of Life Enki, on the other hand, decided to educate the smartest of the Lulus and teach them about their own history, the history of the gods and how they came to be. In other words, he gave them quite a lot from the Tree of Knowledge. However, he didn't teach everybody, and he didn't teach them everything not even Enki wanted the humans to become like the gods, he only wanted them to give them the taste and perhaps the ability to eventually set themselves free. He spent a lot of time with his creation, to observe and teach them, he taught them how to create fire in the woods at night to keep wild animals away. He taught them which plants to eat, and how to hunt. 
He even taught them to draw, an art they used to create cave paintings and paintings on stones. Enki taught them basic survival skills, but the most intelligent of the Lulus he took aside and spent extra time with, teaching them more esoteric knowledge about astronomy, astrology, where the gods came from etc. This knowledge was kept secret within a secret society called the Sisterhood of the Snake, and then there was another, the Brotherhood of the Snake, which consisted of only males, whose purpose was to protect the females and their wisdom. So, the Lulus he took aside to teach what later became shamanism were almost exclusively women, because Enki, being an Aryan, knew about the Divine Feminine, and although he supported his father, the Syrian King Anu, in many ways, he still had love for his mother, the Queen, and respect for the power of the Divine Feminine. So he taught these special women the art and religion of shamanism, the religion of the Mother Goddess, and let them learn how to practice it. To his excitement, Enki noticed that he had done a very good job over there at the lake on top of the Siberian mountain, because these human women were extremely powerful and could quite easily be taught how to connect with the 96%, the Khaa. Although, to a certain degree it concerned him, because if the Syrians happened to find out, they would definitely want to suck in that power, he knew his Syrian friends too well. So this was reason enough to keep even most of his own special creation ignorant. Therefore, Enki selected out his own best shamans and let them practice, and when other women showed talent enough in the matter, he sometimes taught them, too. But he didn't want too many to know the secrets of the gods. The Bible says that Adam and Eve ate the fruits from the tree of knowledge and the tree of life, and this was related to the original sin. Well, there is no original sin, except in the eyes of some gods, like in Lil slash YHVH slash Jehovah and his clan, who wanted to keep mankind ignorant and afraid that they would become like the gods. If that's our original sin, mankind is guilty as charged. However, in terms of the universe, it's called evolution. The tree of knowledge is the wisdom of learning about sexuality. The true tree of knowledge does not only teach you how to be intimate with a partner in general, that's something a sexual being can find out by themselves. The tree of knowledge has to do with sex magic and how to connect with the Khaa through the female orgasm and close intimacy between partners who love each other, like we talked about already in the first paper in level 2. This was learned in the beginning of time through shamanism, which is a religion originating in Belt of Orion, and which Enki knew about. So he initiated some of the females into these sacred rituals. This way, if each tribe had a shaman or two, these gifted women of fire could become multidimensional while still anchored and grounded in their bodies. If the tribe needed to know the outcome of some important decisions, or the solution to certain problems, the women of fire split and extended their fire across the dimensions by engaging themselves and the tribes in ecstatic dance and sacred sex to find the best possible outcome for the survival of the tribe. The best of them were very successful and considered crucial for the tribe and its survival. The men of the tribes protected the women of fire with their lives. The tree of life had to do with the longevity of the gods. This was another knowledge in Lil and most Syrians did not want the Lulus to know about. It had to do with blood, the life elixir of the goddess the Esma. Again, the Pleiadians explain it best in one of their book, and I quote. In this version of creation, woman sprang from a man. This is not so. It is always the goddess who knows the scoop on making life, because it is the goddess who carries the blood. The Bible relates the story of the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. The tree of knowledge allows you to be informed. Sexual ability and practice equate to the tree of knowledge, the tree that humans were forbidden to eat from. They were forbidden to participate as well with the tree of life. What is the tree of life? Many think that the tree of life is something that grows a fruit. It is rumored that through ingesting this fruit of the tree of life you can gain immortality. In ancient times it was understood that this fruit was the blood of the goddess. That was the fruit of the tree of life. Think of your body and your nervous system as a tree. The stories are not talking about fruits on trees, but to the fruits of the body the secretions and substances that are indeed gifts of the gods. For eons, the gods have been steering you away from this knowledge. 
To have sex with a woman when she is on her blood time is one of the highest vibrations because you go through doorways into other realms. To share the blood is to take on the higher consciousness. Indeed, blood is one of the keys to longevity menstrual blood of the goddess, Esma, in combination with monatomic gold. This is how the gods did it, and still do. Here on earth, we also have access to the blood of the goddess through women's menses. The fire of the divine feminine still flows through her bloodstream today, more so than it does men, because the female came first, and men are just altered females, i.e., they were made out of females, not the other way around, like we have learned from distorted religions. If a male has a true, loving relationship with a female and they have sex during her menstruation, and they know how to enjoy magic sex through the female orgasm in the shamanic ways, and the female is willing to share, the experience not only takes them to the 96%, but the experience is enhanced by the menses, and so is the longevity of the parties. One of the most powerful gifts a woman can give to her man is for him to drink from her menstruation blood, because it may prolong his life, enhance his energy level and make it easier for him to connect to the world beyond four space slash time. The blood was the elixir of the gods, and legend goes how the gods killed the shamanic priestesses, drank their blood and ate their major organs and glands to get the personality of the shaman and thus understand the knowledge these shamanic women held. This did not only happen on earth, there was an old war between the gender which had taken place in this sector of the universe where polarity and free will runs, so as usual, the ways of the gods were just brought down here. For hundreds, or thousands of years, we have been taught that women's menses are dirty, and you shouldn't have sex when she's having her period. Now it's easy to see how they have managed to manipulate us into thinking that we'd better stay away from sex while our partner is having her period, when in fact this would be the best time to engage in that, except if you are planning on having children of course. Also, the women's periods are the perfect time to have unprotected sex for those who prefer that, it's the nature's way of saying, now you can have sex without being pregnant. Want to be pregnant, then have sex when you are fertile. In ancient days, they didn't have condoms or pills to prevent pregnancy, but when they had the right knowledge, they knew when to have sex and when not to, depending on the woman's cycle after had engaged in teaching the most brilliant of the Lulus about most of these things, ENKI made them teachers who taught others whom they thought were worthy of the knowledge of the gods. The rest still remained in ignorance to a large degree, so whether it was ENKI's intention or not, this was the beginning of the creation of elitism. ENKI indeed bred bloodlines which were for more than others, who could understand the secrets, and later on, he set them to rule over mankind. They became whom we today call the global elite, the Illuminati, the international banking cartel, the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, and so on. 7. The Departure of a Divine Species One day, when Lord and Lil had a meeting with the Syrian council outside his domain in Mesopotamia, they got visitors. All of a sudden, out of the forest came a large group of Namluyu. The stopped just a few feet away from the Syrians, who were seated in Enlil's gorgeous garden. The Syrians stood up in their chairs, feeling threatened at first, and the guards drew their weapons. It was a very curious event. Enlil took command over the situation and asked the newcomers, what do you want? Who is your leader? The answer came telepathically, but it didn't seem to come from one being, but from all of them, simultaneously. The message was, we have no leader. We are all leaders and don't need a hierarchy. We are here to tell you that we are leaving. Enlil looked at them, like if he'd heard them wrong. Leaving? Where? The group of humanoids replied we are leaving this dimension. We are protesting what is happening here on this planet, which belongs to the Queen of the Stars and which you have hijacked and changed to your own liking. However, your liking is not compatible with ours. The wonderful animals we used to herd and guard have become nothing but beasts who eat the flesh of each other, just like you eat the flesh and drink the blood of your own creation. Furthermore, you trap and eat defenseless animals, and you have made our cousins into slaves down in the mines and on the plantations and lowered the frequency to such a degree that it is hard for us to stay here even if we wanted to. 
You are changing, and interfering with, what once was set into motion for a purpose that goes beyond your limited comprehension. Don't you see that there is consciousness involved here, and you think you are for more than the species you create and master? Your food source is fear and terror, which you induce in others. But after all, who is living in most fear, the slave driver or the slave? If you are masters of your reality, why then do you need to seal off this planet and hide in a density where few may be able to find you? Whom do you fear? We have seen your intentions and we know your journey, lords of Sirius. We grieve what you have done to Mother Terra, and we grieve what you will do in the future, and to the life you have helped creating. Still, we are not here to judge you, we are solely trying to make you see your own dilemma. For a dilemma it is, one that will be harder and harder to resolve the longer you wait. The Namlu you have spoken. We are leaving, but are first informing you of our departure. There is nothing here for us anymore, and we will go to where our service is still needed and valued. We have also seen that you are planning on using our consciousness in your experiment, and in that we refuse to participate. We are of the Goddess, and we are speaking as one. Enlil shook his head. What were they talking about? However, the next moment the whole group was gone, like they had disappeared into thin air. Within the next few months, departed Namluyu bodies could be found everywhere around the planet. They had simply laid down in groups, and their consciousness had left their bodies at will. The Syrians noticed that they had also managed to escape through the grid. This frustrated Enlil to the maximum, and after that, the DNA of the Lulus were rearranged so the soul could not leave the body at will. Enki was told to chain the soul to the body with a cord, which made it much harder for consciousness to permanently escape their physical vessel, unless the body was really dead. For those who understood, the loss of the Namluyu was tremendous. These divine, magnificent beings, who used to be the guardians of the living library, the keepers of the code, and the masters of frequency, light, and love, were no more to be found in this dimension, and since that time, they have never returned. Few were those who understood the significance of their presence on the planet. After they left, the real decline started on a global scale. The only ones left on Mother Earth to help her keep the worst frequencies of fear and terror under control were now the whales and the dolphins. Without them, our planet would most probably not have existed for long after the Namluyu disappeared. And now, in today's world, whales are hunted down to extinction, and dolphins mysteriously washed up on the shores in groups, and they are all dead. Are they too, just like the Namluyu did in the past, leaving our dimension in droves for the same reason the primordial humans did? Or are the dead dolphins just giving a final warning to a world that still doesn't know how to see and listen? while its most intelligent species continuously misuse energy. Overall, the Syrians were pleased, however, because Enki had helped them create a species which was a mix of Lus, Syrians, Aryans, Vegans, and the domestic apes, and thus changed the Queen's original experiment to such a degree that it had become a totally new species that they now felt that they owned. The Aryans could not come and claim the humans anymore, especially now when the Namluyu were gone. 8. The Cain and Abel Bloodlines Were Cain and Abel real persons, or did they symbolize something else? In this case, I would prefer to look at it from a different angle than what people are used to. From what I can see, Cain and Abel are just personifications of something much bigger. They are simply two different genetic experiments. The Abel experiment was that of the enhanced Homo Neanderthalensis, the spiritual human. This was the prototype Enki and Nin used, both when they created the asexual workers and later, the sexual beings, who were meant to become Homo sapiens, the experiment which was supposed to run well into the future, although it didn't turn out that way in the end. The upgraded version of the Neanderthalensis were quite smart, actually too smart for the Syrian council. The Vegans, who had been here while Enki was gone after the ecosystem on Earth was re-established, did some genetic engineering here, because it was allowed then, and hence created both the Neanderthalensis and Homo erectus. This is why we can find these two species walking the earth at the same time. 
they both had Vejan genes in them. Other founders, Katatu from Orion, were also here for a while and continued enhancing the Neanderthals, but both projects were abandoned when ENKI's team came back. Then after ENKI took what was already there and used the Neanderthalensis, because he found the Erectus being too stupid, it eventually ended with that the Syrian council took in Lil's complaint seriously, and ordered ENKI to discontinue the Neanderthalensis bloodline, the Abel line, and instead concentrate on Homo erectus. Reluctantly, ENKI did what the council had decided, but he enhanced its cranium cavity to make it as intelligent as possible, and still added Namlu eugenes together with his own, and that of nine Hersag Syrian DNA. Then, of course, there was still Vejan DNA in the body since much earlier, and in addition to that, genes from other star races they used when creating the original Homo erectus. The Homo erectus line would equal the Cain line, which eventually became Homo sapiens, the version which is us, today. However, up until about 28,000 years ago, both the Abel and Cain line existed side by side, although ENKI was not upgrading the Abel line anymore. This is of course the simple version, and a more complex version can be read in Anton Parks, The Chronicles of the Gurku, and in the English synopsis, which can be found here http www.zeitlin.net slash end enchantment slash ag3.html number creating humans, and a well-drawn diagram can be found here http slash slash www.zeitlin.net slash end enchantment slash images slash mangan 5e.jpg click on the diagram to enlarge enki had saved his sexual creation but it had been a close call he had managed to justify their existence before the syrian council and king anu himself but they had to be handled under restriction in lil furious had thrown the sexual humans out of the garden, but still used them for labor. They were just not welcomed in the garden to rest after work unless they kept to Lord and Lil's very strict laws and regulations, which all boiled down to that they had to follow any order they got, even if it led to their own demise. The alternative was a certain death in the wilderness. Out of fear, many early humans accepted in Lil's offer. The rest went with ENKI. However, there was a point in time when Enlil realized that it would be beneficial if his creation knew some basic survival skills as well, so Enki and his brother made an agreement that it was okay to teach all humans how to make fire, cook their own food, plant their own gardens, and mate for life instead of just creating babies to be used for slave labor as soon as they were strong enough. Still, the parents were on duty from early morning until late at night and were only allowed to see their offspring when they woke up and before they went to bed in the evening. During the day, the babies and children were taken care of, being put in a nursery, where they were well fed to grow up to become strong workers. Once it was time to put them to work, they were fed much less. At night, the parents often came back, bloody from their bodies having tasted in Lil's infamous whips, and totally exhausted. This was the life of the human slave worker. At least in Lil's workforce got a break on occasion when they were taught basic skills, something they always looked forward to. Enki's followers, however, were taught something in Lil's slaves were never even hinted at the power of shamanism. In the beginning, Enki had them build small communities with cabins close to running water where there was an abundance of food stuff, and the tribe thrived and learned a lot from their teacher. They still had to work hard, but these tribes, who consisted both of enhanced Neanderthalensis and Homo erectus, were mostly working for themselves and their own communities. In the middle of each community was one or more shamanic woman, who knew how to connect their fire with the 96%, which became the most important part of each group. Then, the shamans, who sometimes also could be males, taught others whom they saw had the drive and urge to become shamans themselves. So, these early humans, who followed the ways of Enki, also followed the old ways of shamanism and the religion of the Mother Goddess and the Divine Feminine. In the midst of every tribe was a female, and there were those she had selected to become initiates in the Sisterhood of the Snake, which was a closed society. The creation of such was indeed the sore thumb that stood out in a group which otherwise was doing excellent under the circumstances. By having an elite group amongst the rest of the people, 
who were not allowed to take part of what was taught in this secret society, was indeed the beginning of an unfortunate elitism which would ripple out through the lines of time. This is how it started, and with time it became more and more ego-centered, and offshots to this society were eventually created by those who wanted to know, but were not allowed access to the inner secrets, and therefore stole information from the original society, then using it as a secret to create their own sisterhoods and brotherhoods, which became more and more corrupt as time went by. Enki could have foreseen this, but his idea was that humans are stupid, except for a selected few, who are smart enough to learn some of the secrets of their own history and that of the universe. Much later on, Enki and those who wanted to follow him, some were contempt and wanted to stay where they were, migrated westward and settled down on a big continent in the west, which at that time was located between Europe and the American East Coast. This continent which no longer exists in our reality, has best been remembered under the name of Atlantis. Here, Enki was the king, although he let female shamans run their tribes, having their own sovereignty, but Enki was the coordinator and ultimate authority more so with time than he was to begin with. In Atlantis, he became known in future history as Poseidon, in Greece, and Neptune, in Rome. The Incan shamanic tribes that moved to Mu, whom I will simply call the Lemurians, were practicing the religion of the Mother Goddess and did so in relative peace. They knew better than interfering with neither the Enlilites, the Ram clan, nor the Incats, the Serpent clan, and the petty wars that were eventually going to be played out on the planet between the two groups. The Lemurians were a mix of Project Elohim, the upgraded Homo Neanderthalensis, and Project Erectus the upgraded Homo erectus, none of them being today's Homo sapiens, who were actually not created until after the deluge, contrary to what many researchers believe. However, Project Erectus is the direct ancestors of today's humans, they looked the same, but were taller, while Project Elohim were shorter, more intelligent and naturally more spiritually inclined. Although the first humans, both of Project Elohim and Erectus, were dark-skinned long before Lemurian times, both white-skinned and black-skinned humans existed from both projects. So, before we continue following Enki's and Enlil's escapades, we are going to see what the Enkin shamans who moved eastwards created in Mu. We are also going to see what happened when they suddenly were visited both by benevolent and malevolent giants of impressive stature, some of them building the huge stone monuments from which there are still ruins both on the Easter Islands, in Polynesia, Hawaii, and elsewhere. But first, before we even go into that story, we need to look into who Lord Enki really was a little closer, and what his true intentions were. How benevolent was this being, really? <laughs>